this episode of the NWA 1984 Project. Wrestler Spotlight, Tully Blanchard and Butch Reed. Enzo's Rap Song and the AWA 1984. And away we go. Welcome back to the NWA 1984 Project. I'm your host, Juan Cena, and with me, as always, is Matt Riley. How you doing tonight, Matt? <laughs> I'm super duper because the Cavs are down in a 3 hole. I was once down in a hole. Take oh. three fingers to get out of it. Oh, boy. It's going to do it. Yeah, it's gross. So on this episode, we're going to have another television taping for Jim Crockett Promotions. Again, this is 6.05 Saturday night, guys, so enjoy. But first, I do want to talk about Enzo's rap song. Matt, have you listened to Enzo's rap song? As of I like? watched the video, yes. What are, what are your thoughts on that? This time next year, he will be main eventing for Ring of Honor or one of those guys. You think so? I'm calling it now. I was reading the comments, and most were positive, which really? I was kind of surprised. I was expecting people to slaughtering him. Yeah. But they were like, this is what we need. This guy is saying the truth. He's so good, a different type of star. Now, my thing is two points. One, he wasn't the greatest worker. No. So that's going against him. And two, the whole sexual thing, you know, regardless of innocence, is just a hard thing to shake, which is why it's such a big deal. There are promoters that'll be like, this guy's got a name, people know it. They want to see, you know, our local guy take this guy on. I can just see it happening. Now, maybe not WWE level, but something, for sure. Maybe you'll see him on, like, the Clash of the Juggalos or something. I don't know. They'd probably kill him, too. It it could be one of those things where it's like... Gathering the Juggalos or... Yeah, that or or just a promotion looking to bring in a name. They need somebody of a name that people know. And I think musically, it was fine. I mean, it's not... You know, he's not a rapper, but like for a guy who's not a rapper, it was fine. You know? You know, the message on point, I knew what he was saying. I understood where he was coming from because he was going after the, the internet wrestling community. In some ways, it makes sense because if you remember way back a couple of years ago, he was their darling. He was the next, you know, we got to put him in big cast in the big show and they're holding him back, you know? So he sees that, then he sees them all turn on him in a dime. And let's just say for sake of argument that he's completely in it. Like he did hook up with her or whatever, but like he didn't do anything like she said. You know, you'd be, you'd be pissed too. You know, you'd be angry. Oh, I agree. Then, I mean, I, mean then, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with the sentiment. Say a guy getting out of prison, turn around, get double fingers in the prison, wrongly jailed, understandable. If he was innocent and he was looking at people to have, have his back and they all turned on him, I can see what he's doing. How old is he? You know, how old is he? 29, 32? 31. 31. So he's at year, I mean, obviously wrestling, you can wrestle forever pretty much nowadays. Yeah. But star power wise, he has a chance to redeem himself. I, I can just. You want to say, oh, people don't come back. People almost always come back. They do. He has a couple of things that are going against them. Number one is he's going to have to get go back and, and learn how to work. Because what's big right now, especially in the independent scene, minus a couple of comedy promotions, is they want guys to a high work rate. And if he can't give them the 25, 30-minute 30, you know, 30 match that you right. would get out of a Ring of Honor show or you would get an Evolve show or an MLW show... He can have all the silly catchphrases he wants. That's not going to work on that in that scene. If he hooks up with like an Impact Wrestling, he has a shot. But it's not like he can go to New Japan or something like that. He may not go to AAA. So you know, it's a good possibility that he may never even wrestle again. He might. Like, I'm going to be a rapper now. You know, go down that route. If you watch the matches that he was in, he's not a good worker. He's very sloppy. He's dangerous, and he tends to get hurt often. Which is all not good stuff, especially on the indie scene, because you know right. you, you don't work, you don't eat out there. And like WWE, you got the you know guaranteed contract. 
it's a different you know mentality you need to have on the independent scene, especially then you know. And if you're going to be a dickhead to the guys in the locker room, and if you don't have friends out there, it's going to be very, very tough for them. Yeah. That being said, musically, musically, so I was going to judge this musically, and I'm a big fan of rap music, uh, especially you know late '80s to mid '90s East Coast rap music. I don't listen to a lot of current rap music that goes on today, but I am big fans of like guys like maybe guys that you haven't heard of. Uh, maybe most people haven't heard of would be Talib Kweli, Mos Def, Common, Black Thought, Zarface, who are awesome, by the way. Um, that's a group with a guy out of Boston and one of the members of the Wu-Tang Clan, and they talk about comic books and, and professional wrestling, <laughs> which is fantastic. A guy like MF Doom. And then when I listened to what Enzo was doing, I was like, oh, no. Like, I don't know what, what, what qualifies as good rap music nowadays. Uh, to the kids out there. I hope it's not this. I mean, I don't think it's all that great. Not necessarily a, a, a rapper's rapper. I don't think he's rapping for lyrical content. But if he's not going to be rapping for lyrical content, he need to have, his beats need to be like Kanye West level beats. I don't think you know his production is all that great. Maybe for a first attempt... Well, um, I will tell you this. You know, I went through a lot of the, the uh, comments and a lot of it's very similar theme being presented here, people saying that it started off, they got into it more and more, and they kept saying he's on fire at the end, like, a lot of guys saying, listen to it multiple times now, really digging it. Uh, like I said, I just think... But is, made... it, is, it, is it more because, number one, he's a professional wrestler, number two, is, is the content where I'm going after someone who injured me, someone who disparaged me versus more of, like, is it, are they more impressed with the overall story of this? Now we're right now when you know, you know, sexual harassment, rape, like these are all stuff that's all front of mind right now. Me Too movement, it's in full effect right now, and seeing another star go down, and maybe some gentlemen out there with you know that have some angst against women in general, and they see this as a win for them. Like we won this one, you know. Right. They, they took away our Bill Cosby, and they took away this guy, that guy, and the other guy, and they're like, oh, this is a win for us. And, and not kind of understanding the, the, the entire situation where, yes, the charges were dropped. Doesn't mean they cannot be reopened in the future. You know, there was a lack of evidence, you know, that kind of stuff. So just be careful with that. You know, we were careful on this show when we talked about it briefly. Like, we didn't jump to any conclusions, make any assumptions on anybody because, you know, let's let the wheels of justice kind of turn here and see how it kind of ends up. And that was, you know, that was our position here because we're – we're not going out in the limb in any of those situations until we have a full story and have a full understanding and let would it be you know local PD the legal system at large kind of go through their process. But be careful there. You have to go back and understand you know why you like something. Is it because he's a professional wrestler? Is he because he is getting back at people who injured him, or is it musically? Like, would this play on your local radio station in your neighborhood? Are you going to see people drive down the street and you hear the song playing in their cars? Uh, probably not. This was for wrestling fans, you know, by a wrestler. Not any different than Jimmy Valiant's records or Jerry Lawler's records or Hulk Hogan's records or Terry Funk's records or Roddy Piper's records or Bret Hart's records. Well, you know, one thing to think about, too, since this is seeming to be a, a more positive reaction... I would possibly throw out that he's probably going to do more of them. Well, yeah. And I can see him, again, this is my, my own, just in my head how I see things playing out. He's going to do one about Cass or whoever else he felt stabbed him in the back, you know. And people that don't like those guys are going to jump on it. So if he does one about, I don't know, Roman Reigns or whoever he feels like headed out for him, everyone who hates Roman Reigns, which – is a lot of people are going to love it. You know, it's like when you have a, like baby got back, right? Yeah. People, I hate rap music at weddings. That song comes on. They're all busting people out of the way. Get out of my way. Go to the girls on the dance floor. I'm like, all right. You know, like is a, a thing about that song they can associate to. So I can just, I can just see part of it's the, you know, like Roseanne got a show again, you know, wait around long enough. People will take a chance on somebody. They think the star power and I can just see it happening. And, if he makes enough enemies and and you know things play out the right way, who knows? If he creates controversy and he's, you know people are talking about him enough, maybe he's going to New Japan, 
what if he goes to AAA or CMLL or if he goes, you know, wherever, some someplace else, you know, TNA. I don't know. Those, Me- those, those boys in Mexico won't put up with any of his shenanigans. Yeah. They send him back in a fucking pine box. <laughs> For someone who didn't – came into NXT, went through their process – Went through, you know, WWE is all he knows. I yeah. don't know how well he's able to transition where a lot of these other guys who came from independence. And then they go up there and they come back down and they have a name now. He can do extremely well. Overall, we'll see how it plays out. You know, we'll only be following it. Possibly more of an indictment of, of modern rap music than, than anything else at this point. Well, to give you an idea, I sent it to my group of friends, my phone text. I have like six friends I you know, chat with, and a few of them are really versed at rap. Like they're really into the whole scene, old school stuff, but also just lyrically. So he broke it down. And he thought it was, he goes, is this guy's first effort? And I'm like, yeah, you could tell, you know, but that's the thing. He said, it wasn't bad for a first effort, but he needs a lot of work. And that's, I think, the thing where if I'm that guy, I'm building off that. Like, I know I'm not a, a star, right. but... You know, it's like a lot of things, you know, that people will build off it and take whatever they can. I can just see him doing something where there's a promotion looking to get the next big nudge. I mean, wrestling promoters are notorious for doing that. You know, well, it's, like, not like, it's not like a whole bunch of people went and booked Ryback when he left. No, but Ryback was shitty on the mic. He's a guy who can go in the front of the crowd and just tear the fucking place apart. People want to see him fucking get killed. And that's the only thing I think a work rate might not hurt him as much because he can just play ragdoll, get the fucking beat shit beat out of him, you know, cheat and do the heel shit, you know? But I don't know if we necessarily know if he can talk or not. Like we, we, We're making an assumption of his ability to work a mic, and I'm not 100% sold on it because all he had was catchphrases, literally like the road dog. Yeah, well, I will say, you know, one of my problems with that them as a team was that first it was... Oh, okay, those guys, blah, blah, blah. And then it got to be like, all right, we get it. If he evolves, he can stay in the business. If he can't evolve, he's going to fucking die slow death out there. He'll end up in some porno. You wait. Enzo and Lanny Poffo. I mean, I I would watch it. I mean, (laughs) I watched all the other ones, so I'm not going to say I wouldn't. Like, oh, let me check this shit out. Curiosity, morbid curiosity, perhaps. All right, so next up is our wrestler spotlight. And we're going to start with, I know, one of your all-time favorites, Matt, Tully Blanchard. Okay, fans, there it is, a symbol of the four horsemen. Tully Blanchard, the winner of the event with a slingshot suplex over the menace. And earlier we had seen Arn Anderson. And Arn Anderson came out with that gourd buster and won his match. As we said before, the four horsemen are still together, and Tully Blanchard with another great win right here on the Super State. You know, Tony Schiavone, I was listening earlier on a minor, Ricky Morton, I want, I want, I want! People with belts around the ring, beach up! Ricky Morton, there's 1987! It's not gonna happen. I'm an ultimate wrestler. You wanna wrestle me? Anytime, any place. But you got to remember, that was done, not personally. Excuse me, Mr. Jim Crockett is out here. Mr. Crockett? What, do you got another check to cancel or something? Uh, no checks to cancel. I got a proverbial good news and bad news for you. The good news is on October the 18th, the fans in the Omni will get to see Tully Blanchard wrestle. Okay. The bad news for Tully Blanchard, it will be in a lumberjack, and the lumberjack will have belts. Do what? Well, that really is what Ricky what Morton was talking. He said that the lumberjacks at the Omni on the 18th will have belts around the ring when you go up against uh, Ricky, I guess. Can you believe that? Belts! The leather straps. What happened was... to wrestling? Wrestling's on the marquee. Says nothing about lumberjack matches. Oh, God. Regroup. Mr. Okay. Crockett! Okay. Right. Cancel right. chicks! Right. Dusty Rhodes! Money above! It all fits together now! Let's please take the horsemen down! They're getting too big for their britches, huh? Well, that's fine! You want lumberjacks? Bring belts! Mr. Crockett, you be one of the lumberjacks! You come down there with a big belt! Because I'm gonna throw Ricky Morton right in your lap! And the one thing you don't think about, Ricky Morton, the lumberjack belt match. Everybody in the ring gets ripped like I just did to you on national television. Ripped you like you were a little boy. Now, Ricky Morton, you think about it. Because when it's all over in the Omni or any place else, I'm gonna whip you. Orange gonna be whipping you. He'll be out there with a belt. 
and we're going to take you down, and then the championships are ours. It's been your pleasure, as usual. We're coming right back. <laughs> so, yes. Matt, what are your thoughts on Tully Blanchard? I always liked Tully Blanchard because he was always a bad guy. I've, I don't remember him ever being a face, but that's no. just... He also looked like a boss I had <laughs> at one point, uh, who was a cool guy in a lot of ways, but he was also kind of a badass at ways. So... I had that Tully kind of like, oh, like familiarity. I will forever love the Magnum TA angle where he uh, came out and punched him. <laughs> and I, my love about that most is he got so angry. He got so angry he screwed up his words. And he meant to say, stop sticking your nose in the ring. Yeah, you know, he said, stop sticking your ring in. <laughs> but to me, that was like, that's what someone does when you're so angry, you say things a little bit off. And here he is, truly the boss, Magnum PA. Welcome, Billy. Well, thank you, David. You know, maybe it's time to clear a few things up here. There's been a few discrepancies going on. People say a little controversy. Well, I say there's a whole lot of controversy because, you see, it wasn't so long ago that I came out here and tried to end, lend my expertise, maybe do a little commentating here on TBS. And everybody took that opportunity to take their pot shots at me. So I had to move into a new adversity in life, maybe. I had to pick up a little bit of an equalizer, namely this baseball bat. Well, you know, that doesn't make me feel good because I don't like having to have an equalizer, but I make no mince words about the fact that I'm not 100% yet. I'm not ready to climb back in the ring, but that day will come. So Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson, I don't apologize for getting involved in a situation where it should have just been four men involved, but again and again, James J. Dillon has to put his two cents worth in. Well, I just merely put in my two cents worth, and then Tully Blanchard wanted the bat. Well, he wanted the bat. I gave him the bat, and it felt real good doing it. Because, you see, I'm no commentator. I'm no fancy damn guy to dress up. The warrior still lives inside me. You know, Magnum, you and I go back a long, long way. You know, I know that they're selling videos of you and I in an I Quit match. And you love it. You're getting money off of me. Because something that didn't happen, I've had to live for two years with I Quit. I Quit. Everywhere I go, I Quit because of you. But you know, Magnum, I felt sorry for you. Poor Magnum, like everybody else. He got hurt. Poor ended his career. Well, that's too bad. But you know, Magnum, when you start sticking your nose back in our business again, you stay out until you can crawl back in the ring. Then you start sticking your ring in. I don't care about equalizers. You want to bat far enough. You just want far enough. You just want to. Oh. oh my God. Disturbing day for many of us here. And Mr. James J. Dillon, leader of the Four Horsemen, the only thing we have to say is, is really what's on your mind right now. Well, first thing on my mind is I'm out here at this moment. Not to say anything cute, not to come out here to entertain you. I'm not out here to brag about the four horsemen. I'm out here to address the situation that took place not ten feet from me earlier today. Now, Magnum PA, number one, first, we saw your interference in a match, Cincinnati, Ohio, where the world tag team titles were at stake. And even though the fans here today maybe didn't see the total story following the match, the horsemen put it on record that we would not tolerate any such incidents again. You were out there under the guise of a commentator sitting at the desk with a microphone in front of your hand. Now, I realize, because I've been in competition myself, that you as a champion had a fire inside of you that only champions have. And even though you were in a horrible wreck, that fire, that flame inside of you was never stuffed out. Now, you've had to fight back some physical disabilities, and my heart went out to you at one time, but life is tough. Okay? And we are not going to excuse you coming out and interfering in any of our matches. I think Tully Blanchard put it best, because he's still eating inside over an I Quit incident three years ago where he says he never said the word. And we're not going to tolerate you coming out. Magnum, like he said, either get in rehabilitation, put a pair of tights on, or get lost. And when you came out here today shooting your mouth off, you just asked for it. You're the one that precipitated the whole thing. And all he did was tell you, right to your face, exactly what was going to happen. And when Dusty Rhodes came out here, Barry Windham, you can, it's just a big mess is what it is. Now, the most important thing is, 
that Dusty Rhodes, a man that was three times NWA World Heavyweight Champion, the man that everybody calls the legend, the man that everybody loved and endeared and looked up to, took a baseball bat. That's right, a baseball bat, and struck one of the members of the World Tag Team Championship team, and then Jim Crockett Jr., on the board of directors of the National Wrestling Alliance, was struck a blow at the hands of that same man, the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes. Now, this type of action cannot be tolerated by anyone. And it's a weekend. I can't do much right now. But Monday morning at 8 o'clock, there will be a copy of this incident on personal videotape, hand-delivered by a courier to every single member of the NWA Board of Directors. And they can watch it a hundred times. One time is all I think they need to see it. And then I'm not, I'm not requesting. I'm demanding that the American dream, yes, your three times former world heavyweight champion, U.S. champion, be barred from wrestling for the rest of his life. And that's the bottom line. I don't have anything further to say. Can I say something right here? I don't take sides. I'm not condoning what Dusty Rhodes did with a baseball bat to Mr. Crockett. We're supposed to have a match in the ring. I think it, it, it warrants that we take a look at it right now. And I think what you'll find, Jim, you'll agree with me, it really totally instigated this whole matter from the beginning. That's beside the point, and you can show it. I would love to see it again because I think this message speaks for itself. And it's the same thing that every member of the board of directors is going to view Monday morning at 8.01 when their doorbell rings. And then, like I said, I'm demanding that the American dream, Dusty Rhodes, and I'll say it right now, be barred from wrestling for the rest of his life. Of course, then he belts him, and Dusty comes up with a bat, and, you know, Jim Crockett gets wailed on. And it, it just, he was a great bad guy. The Magnum TA feud was awesome. It, it just really good. So I was happy that, um, you know, he went to the, he eventually got, to, got over that way. The Rockers and tag team competition, they'll face the Brain Busters. And right now, Arn Anderson and Telly Blanchard are standing by with Bobby Heenan. You know, the little teeny boppers that scream for the Rockers make me sick. But watching you getting carried out of that ring, that's going to make me feel real good. You know, you think back to that fateful night, San Francisco Cow Palace, 12,000 screaming people, the busters coming down the aisle, and you guys get the butterflies in your stomach. What's going to happen when they get in the ring? Oh, well, let's attack them behind their backs, and then we'll see. The old adage is, go big or stay home. You see, they look at us and they say, where do we fit in in the scheme of things? We're used to shocking people. We've shocked people all our life. They call us overachievers. So when you crawl in with us, don't expect anything but an overachievement. If you're going to be a victim, you might as well just resolve yourself to the fact that you failed to the best. I know the whole thing with the, how his career kind of, if you want to call it, ended with a yeah. cocaine thing. But yeah, what happened was he he left the WWF in, in late 89, had a contract ready to go and... WCW in 1990, but he failed a cocaine test in, in the WWF, and they revoked his contract for WCW. Yeah, that's BS. And then they cut arms pay, <laughs> like, in half. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, fuck you guys. Yeah, I mean, it kind of ended on a whimper. You know, they were, they were supposed to bring him back a couple different times in WCW to reform the horseman, but never that never worked out. But he ended up, you know, you know getting his life together, you know, you know, he became a minister, you know, in a pri- in a prison. So, you know, he, he's doing he's he's doing good works out there. You know, I remember good. reading a story where he said he woke up and was like screaming, "Jesus, take my life!" And it's like, <laughs> okay, how are we going to get there, buddy? But <laughs> just picture like, like it's it's life. funny. It's funny that uh, apparently he became a born again Christian November thirteenth of eighty nine. And that's around that last time he failed that. That's about around the time he got popped for that drug test. Yeah, well. Because he was supposed to be in Survivor Series 89, but he was already he was already gone. And that's why it was Heenan and Anderson in the Tully. So. so in terms of, of Tully Blanchard overall, again, he debuted in 1975, son of famous professional wrestler Joe Blanchard. He was in the AWA. Uh, he was trained by his dad and Jose Lothario, who also sh- trained Shawn Michaels. He attended West Texas University, where he played football with you know, Tito Santana and Ted DiBiase. They're all on the same team. He played quarterback, so that's why he has, probably has that uh, cocky 
and demeanor. He probably has one of the most punchable faces in professional wrestling. Like <laughs> just you just look yeah. at him and he's just, it's his heat. His heat, 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 heat. Here is the new Southwest Television champion, Tully Blanchard. Uh, the new, I don't really like the new Southwest champion. I should have been the Southwest champion all the time. People saw right here on this show what happened. Valentine pushed Madrill on top of me when I was knocked out, and, Va and Madrill was knocked out. We were both knocked unconscious, and the man ended up on top of me. The referee didn't say anything. Madrill pranced and raided around with my belt. But that's all right. I didn't get on television and cry to the people, cry to the state, cry to the NWA, anybody. I just went back in that ring and I got tougher and I got meaner and I got more desperate because I wanted this belt back. It meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to me to show the people what kind of champion I was. And I've got the belt back. People booed me. They say, you did this, you did that, Colosetti helped you. Colosetti didn't help me. Madrill was inside the squared circle. I was inside the squared circle. And I won. But you know, Madrill, he went in there and won that junior heavyweight title. That was good. He shouldn't have lost that weight because it's tougher when you get in with a heavyweight. He was a star for his dad's promotion, Southwest uh, Championship Wrestling. Welcome to Southwest Championship Wrestling. We've got a great lineup for you today. The dynamic duo is here. Bob Sweet and the girls, the Mongolian Stomper and more. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the Southwest Tag Team Champions, and I guess congratulations in order. I hate to congratulate you after what I saw you do here on You guess congratulations are in order. Steve Stack, I'm almost ashamed. You should be kissed the ground that you are standing on just to be on the screen with the dynamic duo, the Southwest Tag Team Champions. You know, you can talk about how bad Lucas is hurt or whatever, but I tell you what, we brought a little film for you people to see. It was a big match in Houston, Texas last week. Southwest Tag Team title. Ken Lucas, Ricky Morton against the dynamic duo, Gino Hernandez, Tully Blanchard. And we just want you people to watch and see about your heroes and how much punishment they can dish out and how much the dynamic duo can take and still walk out of the ring with the belts. Gino Hernandez. <laughs> what it all boils down to is I guess last week on television, we literally tore the heart out of Ken Lucas because when the going got tough, you uh, you definitely faltered because the belts are back where they belong. We're not the new champions, we're the true champions. We've always been the champions, and as you can see on the tape, like he said, they came at us with everything, and we still walked out of the ring with the belts. I'd like to say, let's don't hear about Lucas and Morton no more because you don't have a partner anymore, Ricky Morton. Ken Lucas, retire. Go back and find another profession because you can't put a sleeper on with one arm. <laughs> From the, the tag team with Gino Hernandez called the Dynamic Duo. Gino Hernandez, another guy who just fucking just was a heat magnet. He would just generate so much heat. Did you remember that time where Gino Hernandez had pictures of like him and Farrah Fawcett? No. He was, he, yeah, he, he's on TBS. <laughs> and he has pictures of him and Farrah Fawcett. Like, you know, like 1981, 1982, whatever it was. And apparently they were real. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's legitimate. And it, it's part of the youth and the young athletes of the day, and one of them is Gino Hernandez. Now, is this a great man or not? He is quite an athlete, there's no question about it. And I believe you do want to if, interview him at if this If you time. wouldn't mind, I would like to take Mr. Soli this opportunity right to interview this great athlete. You see... Mr. Hernandez, I would like to say that it's a pleasure and I owe you an apology because when I saw you in the ring, first of all, it did not click amazingly enough with me. You are Gino Hernandez. You are famous in Texas. I've seen you wrestle. You have beaten opponent after opponent and I apologize. And what you did here is just part of being the young youth scientific wrestler of the day. Slip right in there and we have something in common. You destroyed Brad Armstrong. I destroyed Daddy Bob. And I just want you to know that it is a pleasure to have you here. This feeling is mutual. I just like to say I feel kind of guilty about being so conniving to kind of slip in here in such a low key way. But I'd like to say it had to be done, as you know, Roddy, because all these so called champions and these egomaniacs like Dusty Rhodes and like the Garvin guy and uh, leave it be like the Armstrongs, which are more washed up than Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, and Roberto Duran combined. I'd just like to say to all you people out there, gorgeous Gino Hernandez, 
the handsome half-breed. I'm more handsome than Sylvester Stallone and Eric Estrada combined. More gorgeous than Bo Derrick. And let me say something. You know, the biggest nuisance that's been bothering me for so long is one blonde-headed punk sissy by the name of Tommy Rich, who everybody calls Wildfire. Well, I'd like to say, Tommy Rich, you talk about all the women screaming about you. Well, I want to point something out to you, Tommy Rich. I want to point it out. All these women. Well, I've always gone by the saying, quantity over quality. And right here, I have something to show you from last Tuesday night in Houston, Texas. Right here, Roddy, I'd like to show you and the people pictures, no other than Farrah Fawcett on her birthday. Who does she choose to be with on her birthday? No other than gorgeous Gino, the handsome half-breed. Now, what do you got to say, Tommy Rich? Hey, pretty boy, what do you got to say about that? Farrah Fawcett didn't come and looking for you when she wanted to celebrate her birthday. Nobody's looking for you that's anybody, Tommy Rich. And let me say something, wildfire, you're nothing. You are nothing. You know, I don't blame the women for their inferior choice by pulling and rooting and crying and screaming over Tommy Rich only because of they've had nothing to compare to. But Tommy Rich, comparing you to me, at the age of 24, I've accomplished more than any man in any sport. And comparing you to me is like comparing a Volkswagen to a Rolls Royce. There is no comparison, right? You're exactly right, Jeff. That's a pleasure. You see, this is this is youth. This is science. This is champion. This is what we've been talking about. And Mr. Hernandez, we could continue. But, oh, isn't that so sweet? But why talk anymore? Because if we try to tell them too much, we talk over their heads. So let's go to a commercial because it's been your pleasure. So he was hanging out with Farrah Fawcett. You know, good looking kid. Good for him. Yeah. In 84, he left uh, Southwest uh, Championship Wrestling, you know, which promptly folded. Uh, he joined Jim Crockett Promotions. Came out early in 84, and he was challenging Flair. Looks like they were about to feud. He had a feud with Mark Youngblood over the television championship. And then he would defend the belt against like Ricky Steamboat at Sarkade 84. And right here, here's the young man I want to bring in. Rick, it is definitely a pleasure to have you on this it program. It's good to be out here, David. It feels real good. It really does. Ricky Steamboat, if you remember, he wanted his conditions met to wrestle Tully Blanchard for the NWA Television Championship. They have been yes, met, Rick. It feels so good to be out here, David. I'm telling you, for a long, long time, gone through a lot of red tape, a lot of negotiations, a lot of hours, and there's a lot of mind-boggling things that had to be straightened out, but finally I got what I wanted. You definitely did. It's one false 60-minute time limit. The no disqualification rule has, has been waived. Isn't that right? What we're saying that the man has been a coward. Yeah. No doubt about that. To retain that title, that championship, he has time and time again, he leaves the ring. Stalls for time. If he so happens, leaves the ring and stalls for time, he can lose the championship. That's right. Plus, when we said the no disqualification rule is waiver, in other words, if he tries to get himself disqualified right. to save that championship, lose the Ricky Steamboat becomes the champion. Oh. Plus, what? if he tries to stall, tries to stall for time, Ricky Steamboat will become the champion. How in the world did you get Tully Blanchard to agree to such stipulations as that? I had to put up myself. Oh, I had to put yeah, up some. Okay, right. And I guess, as everybody knows, um, money does talk a little bit. You know, he's putting up a championship, he's putting up $10,000, right? Well, you know, he approached, uh, approached him about this thing, man to man, look at him, I die, and I saw what he's putting up. But then everybody knows what kind of man he really is. You know, to retain that championship, he does nothing but stalls and then runs out and gets out on the, on the floor out there and tries to regroup and everything else. You know, but he, he did put my back up against the wall for a little bit. So I'm putting up $10,000. I'm putting up $10,000. I mean, it's coming right out of my pocket. It's going to be laid right out there on the table. I'm putting up $10,000. All right, David, are we going to sign this now and get this match signed? Yes, is sir. Yes, sir, Reed, we're going to sign it. We're going to sign it right here. I tell you what, I've got, I had it written on the back of this. We're going to sign. Use Rick, my pen right here. Rick, uh, you would. Bob would be uh, happy to use your pen. Like I said, this is a good day. This is a great day. This is something that everybody's been looking forward to, especially myself. I know Blanchard is probably a little hot and probably squirming right now. And probably got some sweat in his shot. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Here comes, here comes Mr. Here he is. You know what? 
right there, Cat. You do too, and you do too, Mr. Steamboat. But I tell you what, I've done it. I had to give up a ton. I had to give up all the rules. I had to give it all up. But now you got something to lose. Money, Steamboat. Not just your reputation. You got money on the line. Thanksgiving night, I'm going to walk out of there with this belt. I'm going to walk out of there with $20,000. You're going to be down on the dirt. Let me tell you something, Blanchard. Okay? I put up the $10,000. You thinking that you're going to walk away with my ten grand? I put up the $10,000 to get you to carry you time and time again. Time and time again. I carried you. Time limit. Time limit. Time limit. You couldn't beat me in a million years. I put up the $10,000, brother, to get you to sign that contract because I know. I know I can beat you. I know. I can kick your can any time of the day. Big night. Hey, if you will see. Thanksgiving night. Why wait? Why wait? Why don't we get it on right now? Steamboat. Why don't you get it on right now? You can see Steamboat. I'm out here looking very nice, looking very dressed. I'm not ready to wrestle. Like last week, right? Huh? You're not dressed to wrestle. You're not. Let me tell you something, Blanchard. Huh? Let me tell you something. What am I going to have to do to you to get you in the ring? I want a piece of you right now. You know something, you yellow dog? Your mother sucks eggs. Your father eats refried beans, brother. What do you think of that? Come on in the ring. gentlemen something. Wait. If I came out here to wrestle, wait a minute. I'd be ready to wrestle. He's now that just shows you what kind of unclassy person. Unclassy person that Ricky Steamboat is. The whole horseman thing it kind of exploded. Uh, with the, you know, well, first of all, before the horseman thing was the whole baby doll thing, where he's been managed by baby doll, and that was a whole that was a whole thing with you know, you know <laughs> where Dusty got the services of baby doll. And you know, as a kid, I didn't necessarily know what that meant, but looking back at the doll, it's like that means he was having sex with baby doll, Dusty Rhodes. By the what? way, I looked up uh, Farrah Fawcett, Junior Hernandez. Bang, there it is. Yeah. That's legitimate. Good for him. Yeah. 
And bad for cocaine. God damn it, drugs. In 85, uh, Tully fired Baby Doll as his manager. Where in the world have you been? Well, Tully, you should know you get. JJ gave me the ticket to Acapulco. You, he said it was my Christmas present JJ for you. JJ gave you what? From me? JJ gave me a ticket to Acapulco for my Christmas present from you. JJ, come here. You gave me the ticket, remember? You said it was a Christmas present Sounds from like Trump. Sounds like some rotten in Denmark to me, but I, I didn't tell JJ. JJ, come on, tell him. You're a real sweetheart, baby doll, and I think the world of you. But you're going to have to figure out some other way to cover your tracks because I don't know what you're talking about. JJ, come on, tell him. You gave me the hey, ticket. Get your hands off of him. No, if you're taking ticket. off... You're bought and paid for. You're no. my, you're my kid. Yeah, you and if you're up running off, if you're running off. Well, you're talking about Bedlam in a situation there. Well, I'm going to tell you what. You saw it right there. That's right. Baby doll had to cover her tracks, put, put all the heat on James J. Dillon right there to cover her own track because she was off flattening around with somebody else. Well, baby doll, you are mine, bought and paid for. I don't care if Dusty Rhodes comes out and wants to take you or do anything else. Dusty Rhodes, you don't stick your mind in my business ever again. I made the World Television Championship, I made the U.S. Heavyweight Championship, and I'm going to take you down, Dusty Rhodes, and I'm going to take the National Heavyweight Championship from you, the Domino Effect, Jimmy Valiant, anybody you run around with. And don't you forget, Dusty Rhodes, you're at the top of all those. And when you get back in that square circle with me, I'm going to finish the job that I started last year, and I'm going to take Baby Doll back, and she's going to have a lesson taught her like no lesson ever taught to anybody. Got the services of J.J. Dillon, and then it went right into the Horseman thing. And, you know, that original Horseman team of Oldie, Arn, Tully, and Flair, um, probably the best. You know, you can interchange that that version and the one with Wyndham in there, I think, uh, as your, your, you know, your best kind of, uh, you know, version of the Horseman. But they, they all had championship belts. They're all awesome. And, you know, they're pretty much running roughshod over the entire territory. Again, the, he would go on to feud with Nikita Koloff, Dusty Rhodes, Rocco McDaniel, Rock and Roll Express, and the Road Warriors. The National Heavyweight Champion, James J. Dell. What in the world is this, J.J.? Well, I want to relive Ron Garvin's nightmare for a few people that may have missed it. Here I am, Tully Blanchard, the National Heavyweight Champion, standing over top of the prone Ronnie Garvin. Ronnie Garvin, I know you don't know what day of the week is, but it's Friday. It's Friday, May 23rd. Tully Blanchard just knocked you out. First time in your career. What do you have to say? You say, I, I, I want I quit. I quit. I quit. I quit. I quit. I quit. I can't imagine. You know, you have to think of that thought morning, noon, and night. Every breath, every bite of food, every drink of drink you have, Ronnie Garvin, every waking moment, every nightmare you have is you being carried out. <laughs> and I'm the man that did it, James J. Dillon and I, Tully Blanchard Enterprises, Ronnie Garvin, and now you want to go tape fist in three-minute rounds to separate the men from the boys. Well, Ronnie Garvin, are you sure? Are you truly and truly sure every time you look at that mirror, every morning, every night, convince yourself that you're really as tough and as bad as you are? Ronnie Garvin, are you sure that the Great American Bashes, you want 10 three-minute mounts with me? Because, Ronnie Garvin, I am the only man, the only man on the face of this earth that has had you carried out of any arena from one end of the world to the other in professional wrestling. That's right, Ronnie Garvin. Do you want to walk that aisle and set foot back in the ring with the man that knocked out the hands of stone? Oh, 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 the new name, what is it, James? Hands of Marsh. <laughs> ordinary tape. <laughs> oh, that's right. No excuses. Ordinary, ordinary tape. You know, him and Dusty Rhodes. Athlete him and Dusty Rhodes. Oh, yeah. Every athlete uses this ordinary roll of tape. Tried the big embarrassment, but the embarrassment backfired. And you want to get in the ring with me, the Bashes, 
That's fine with me, Garvin, because my hands will be taped up just like Sugar Ray's litters were. Ha ha, Ronnie Garvin. Adios. All right, Pez, here we go. We're ready with action to the ring. Before he left Jim Crockett Promotions, Anderson and Blanchard dropped the belt to the Midnight Express in a rare heel versus heel match that ended up in a title yep. switch. So, you know, that's amazing. In 88, he joined the WWF with Arn Anderson. They were the Brain Busters. Uh, did end up winning the WWF Tag Team Championships. They, they beat Demolition. They eventually did drop it back to Demolition, uh, right like right before they left. So you know he had a good run in WWF, and he was getting a lot of heat in the WWF too. Even though you know he's not that big, you know, he's five ten, two twenty five, right? In an era where you had your Barbarians and <laughs> and, your, and your Bundys and and Andres and and Warlords. He was also an excellent talker. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's funny that they put they put they put Anderson and Tully with Bobby. They didn't need fucking Bobby. No, because Arn Anderson is an amazing fucking talker too. Yeah. After after not being able to get his contract from WCW, uh, he ended up going to the AWA in March of 1990. Basically, he only he only lasted there to May of 1990. In 93, he was offered to come back to reform the Horsemen, but that was only $500 per week, and he was like, fuck that shit. He did appear in one match in Slambury 94, where he wrestled Terry Fonta double DQ. Did some time in uh, ECW, um, not a whole lot, and eventually just, you know, retired in, in 2007 by doing, you know, kind of random shots, you know, in between his gigs as a prison minister and what have you, so... Tully Blanchard, I think one of the all-time greats, probably one of the best heels of all time. Um, he was fucking fantastic, and he can go in the fucking ring. And that I quit match with Magnum TA. Oh, amazing match! Fucking amazing! Like, go out and like stop listening to us. Stop <laughs> what you're doing. Go watch that match and then come back because it was fucking amazing. So, you know, I tell you what, you ladies and gentlemen, I'm standing here in an empty arena. Just thinking about Jerry the King Lawler. You know, you people of Memphis and the state of Tennessee, the only thing good about the state of Tennessee is it starts with a T. The same letter the state of Texas starts with. And you know, Jerry Lawler and the people of Memphis, the Mid-South Coliseum, seats some 16,000 people. Well, Jerry Lawler, I tell you what, I'm bringing my own camera crew my own camera crew so I can put this on national television on the USA cable network just for you Jerry the King you who pile drive 130 pound comedians on their head you who come to the state of Texas and try to become the Southwest heavyweight champion and don't succeed because the one Tully Blanchard wrestled you in the semifinals and you were just a little short of the mark you know, Jerry Lawler, seems to me everybody in Memphis, Tennessee, is a little short of the mark. The U of H, I don't recall the score, but I'm sure it was something excess of 10 points when the great, formerly ranked number one Memphis State basketball team in the recent NCAA tournament got put down by the U of H from the great state of Texas. But you know, Jerry Lawler, on that Monday night in the Mid-South Coliseum, when I come strolling in, in my electric robe, $3,000 worth of lighted roses. Jerry Lawler, I'm coming after the international title. And you know, Jerry Lawler, I wanted you to come to Texas. I wanted to rush, wrestle you for that belt in Texas. But you know, I understand from a person named Terry Funk that you like to be wrestling in Memphis, in Tennessee, in your home state, where the fans are on your side, the commission's on your side, the referees are on your side. But I tell you what, Jerry Lawler, when you have a man, when you have class like I do, a man of my stature, I don't care if you have your father referee in the match, or even maybe your wife or your kids. Because you see, Jerry Lawler, when you've got it, you've got it. And when you don't, you don't. You know, I don't need to come riding up to the ring on a white horse or come up out of the ground with a lot of smoke or play music or play anything. You know, Jerry Lawler, I step into the ring to do business, Texas style. And you know, Texas, 
is the place where all the toughest wrestling happens. You know, I was reading a magazine from Madison Square Garden the other day. The main event was a Texas death match. All the toughest matches in professional wrestling start with the word Texas. Texas Tornado tag team matches. Jerry Lawler, you're not from the state of Texas. I am from the state of Texas, where all the toughest wrestling happens. So Jerry Lawler, I want you to bring out all your friends. I want you to get your mama and your daddy and your brothers sitting on that front row so that they can see and watch you scream and cry and whine. Because I tell you what, Jerry Lawler, the building is not going to be empty like this one. It's not going to be empty like this one. There's going to be 16,000 screaming fans going, oh, poor Jerry. Poor, poor Jerry. He lost his belt to an out-of-stater. Too bad. Don't forget that he has a daughter that's currently a wrestler. That is Tessa Blanchard. And she is fantastic. It's, it's almost criminal. That she's not currently in the WWE. Like, how does that, how's that make any sense? Well, you know, I think uh, she's going to be at all in, so she'll be fine. She's amazing on the mic, and she can work, and you can put her right with Charlotte. Like, right off the bat. Oh, I... Like, I there's a dynamic there. I will be stunned if that didn't happen at some point. Because uh, they would have to. Wrestling, especially Triple H knows the history of wrestling. Yeah. Either, either have them be, you know, teammates or enemies. Yeah. You know, because I you think... You do both. You can do... You know, how, tall is, how tall is Tessa Blanchard? Um, I don't think she's as tall as Charlotte, because Charlotte's at, like, almost six foot. She's 5'5". Five, five. Okay. But she has, you know, she was trained by Tully and Magnum TA because her stepdad is Magnum TA, and that's a whole thing. Right. Yeah, it sure yeah, is. That's a whole thing. <laughs> she's currently uh, in a relationship with our good friend Ricochet. Is she really? Yeah. Good for Ricochet. Good for Ricochet, man. It he, makes me he, like him even more. <laughs> like it's like it's funny because like uh, <laughs> you get in these situations where, like I seen Ricochet when he first started and he looked nothing like he looks now. You're like ah okay, he looks like kind of a dork, right? Yeah. And it's like you see him now and you're like ah oh, he's he's one of the best wrestlers in the world and like you know, his girlfriend or future wife is, is amazingly hot and awesome. And it's like, man, you're just awesome. You're cool all around. These extra cool points. Like, he I needed any more than he already got. I always enjoy the uh, being the elite videos where they call Joey Ryan's hot wife. <laughs> <laughs> Who's on the phone? Joey Ryan's hot wife. Nice. Oh, all right. <laughs> so that is uh, Tully Blanchard. Uh, next up, I want to talk about uh, another one of our favorites that we talk about. Probably a little too much. Mo- <laughs> we probably talk about him more than we probably should. But that is the natural himself, Butch Reed. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with two proud men, two tough men. Both of you stand alone. Butch Reed, I heard you say you stand alone. And Dugan, I know you stood alone. But what I've seen about Akbar and DiBiase, the Rat Pack, or the armies he calls them, I don't know if any one man can stand alone. And during the commercial break, I tried to get you to come over here. You've consented to come over here. I think you guys need to kind of tell everybody your feelings about this well, situation. Probably, probably, Bill Watts, before, after we get done here, me and Butch need to probably go somewhere and sit down and talk down man to man, eye to eye, and just get a few things straight. But if anybody, after two long years of banging heads with somebody, you learn a lot about somebody. You may not agree. I may not agree. Let me rephrase that. I may not agree with a lot of things Butch Reed does, and I'm sure he doesn't agree with a lot of things I do. But I respect the man because I've been right up there in that circle with him, and I've gone nose to nose. He gave me his best shot, and I gave him mine. And he he came back for more, and I came back for more. So I respect you for that, Butch Reed, and I respect you for standing on your own. Now, I don't blame you for keeping your eye on me, and I guarantee you I want to keep my eye on you. But there's a force coming here in Mid-South that we haven't seen before. It's like a black plague, a cancerous growth, the Skandar Akbar, Ted DiBiase, Hercules and Anders, a few other people joining together. And right, maybe we need to get off camera, and maybe we need to set up a few things and straighten things out around here in Mid-South. You hear what the man said, Bill Watts? He said the whole thing right there. He said respect for your fellow man. We don't fought each other tooth and nail. Matter of fact, I don't run out the junkyard dog. I don't beat up Master G after knee surgery. And this is the only man right now that I got to give respect to as being one of the toughest suckers around here other than me. But it seems like Butch Reed has done lost some of his respect. 
Only SPECT and NASDAQ! So, Matt, what are your thoughts on Butch Reed? I enjoyed Butch Reed. I think he was one of the most underutilized stars. For real. Vastly underrated, underused. He could have been – wasn't it – he wasn't he was the one that won the IC belt at some point? He was supposed to beat Steamboat for the IC belt, but no showed that show. So, they uh, were giving it to the Honky Tonk Man instead. Man. Man. Think about that. An actual Butch Reed with the IC belt. Man. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Like, what, I really hope he met his wife that night. Like, he's like, you know what, I didn't win that belt, but I met my wife. Or, you know, I, I won a million dollars on a scratch ticket. So, screw those guys. Oh, yeah, all right. A World Wrestling Federation card. Slick, come on in. I know about your vast managerial background at Pink Cadillac and those six ladies up in Detroit. But I want to talk right now about Butch Reed, the natural going against Pedro Morales at the West Palm Beach Auditorium here on Wednesday night. Before I say anything about Morales, I'm going to tell you something, Santana. Sooner or later, I'm going to get you. But you know what, Morales, since we can't get you right now, since you best friends with the chump, then you can just step right up and take this whooping that's intended for him. Because nobody but nobody puts their hands on the slickster and then walk away and laugh and brag about it. Now then, I'm going to beat you like a war eyed mattress, brother. Myself, after this man set you up for me, that's all I got to say. All right. I'm on a holding. Butch Reed. I'm on a holding. And I'm on a gagging. And I'm on that slick, take that stick, and just beat all the wet off that boy's back. <laughs> I'm on that slick, take that stick, and I'm going to let him beat the black and blue marks on him. And when he goes visit his mama, she won't even know who he is. Pedro Morales, you just step in line, boy. I know that you and Tito Santana call yourself, hey, y'all, ace Boom Coon, you know, best friends, but y'all don't know what I'm talking about. So you be prime example, because I'm sure enough going to make a prime example out of you, Mr. X, world heavyweight champion. That's right, boy. Butch Reed is on the move. And all you got to do is just pour a little bit more gasoline on the fire to get me to burning, and I'm going to start smoking me some booty down in West Palm Beach, Florida. Starts with you. Thank you very much, Pedro Morales, to meet Butch Reed this Wednesday night. That being said, Butch Reed himself says that's untrue, and if you've watched back the title win that Honky had, uh, Reed's in the ring celebrating with Honky. So... <laughs> Uh, we don't know if that's legitimate at all. So, oh boy, I could definitely see where you know him with the blonde hair with slick. I mean, that's a very, very awesome package that he has, like all together. Plus, he can work and he can talk. Yeah, you know what I mean. I mean, he had probably his best success in Mid South from '83 to '86. You know, would it either be tag team partner with Junkyard Dog or? <laughs> Or feuding with Jim Duggan over the Hacksaw name. Or hanging out with Ted DiBiase and Matt Bourne. You know, he did a lot of really cool shit over there. Uh, that was probably, if you want to watch, like, Bush Reed being Bush Reed being pushed and probably used to the best of his ability, well, definitely watch him in. Flater, you and Flair, you hurt me. You hurt me bad. But you made one mistake. You didn't take the old Hacksaw out. I'm still walking and talking, and I'm still going to be kicking you-know-what and taking names, and it's going to be starting with you, Dick Slater, because you the lying, no-good, kindly dog. You run around here and you're lying. You talked about you gave up 50 grand back to Flair. I knew all along it was a lie. You wasn't fooling nobody but yourself if you're trying to fool me. But look at me, sucker. My neck is in a brace. But I'm keeping my neck in the brace because the doctor wants it that way. Outside the ring, the man done gave me good news that I can take it off when it comes time to me to deal with you in the ring. 
So that's what I'm going to do, Slater. This you ain't playing no more games with Butch Reed. It's my turn. It's my turn to hurt you, Slater. And these people around here at Mid-South know that I know how to hurt somebody. They know that I can put somebody on their head and make them walk around two or three inches shorter. And Slick Rick Flair, you walking around here talking loud and saying nothing, sucker. You scared. You're on the run. That's why you got Slater to do your dirty work. After I get through with Slater, Slater, then you got me to face, Flair. I'm taking you all the way out. Uh, Mid-South. He did send some time in the AWA as uh, Jimmy Garvin's bodyguard, but he didn't stay up there very long. Spent some time in Kansas City for NWA Tensile State. He did team up with Rufus R. Jones as the Soul Patrol, and he was managed <laughs> by Slick, who is Rufus R. Jones' son, by the way, uh, for those of you who don't know that. Oh, really? Yeah. Great promoter here on the Twin Ports has lined up another fantastic holiday spectacular down at the Duluth Arena Sunday night, December the 27th, 7.30 p.m. Start of this one, i got to tell you, is absolutely loaded. I say loaded. In a return from October for the Intercontinental Heavyweight title, Honky Tonk Man again to defend against Macho Man Randy Savage. It's official. The mayor has barred Jimmy Hart from the building, Bartom, I think, from the city, to tell you the truth. However, in the Honky Tonk Man's corner will be his longtime love, his girlfriend, his arm piece, acquaintance, Peggy Sue. And she is very attractive, I don't mind telling you. Special guest referee is going to be the legendary Nick Bockwinkel. I guarantee you, he will call a law and order match. Come on in, if you will, Doctor of Style, the dapper, debonair, clothes horse, Slick, you've got a couple of your men involved in this cart. One man gang is going to be going against Jake the Snake. The Bolsheviks are going to be squaring off against the British Bulldogs in a great tag team matchup. And guess who? Natural Butch Ray meeting the Rock, Don Morocco. That's right, you know. You know, Don Morocco, I can't believe that you had the nerve to come out and interfere in this man's match. You had the nerve to stick your nose in the natural of all people, the natural Bush Reed's business. Don't you know that this man is not to be messed with? Well, you're going to find that out, fool. Uh, By the way, let me point out, superstar Billy Graham is going to be in the rock car. What did you say? But, who? Billy. Who? Who the idea is this? Know, we don't want no fine. Easy. Who the idea was this to put him in the WWF? No, it was probably that big... Blockhead Morocco's idea. Well, let me tell you something, Morocco boy. You think you're making a smart move? Well, all you doing is putting gasoline on the fire, fool. And I'm the fire, and I'm going to explode all over you and superstar Billy Graham, too. So you just see what he got. He's out. I know he can't all his walk. And you ain't got nothing to cripple. But let me tell you something, sucker. I will find something. All right, I thank you. Oh, by the way, Leo Spooner wants to sell you a suit. Slick, here in the loop when you're here over the holiday. We don't want it. So yo, I was wondering, like, where does Slick come from? That's where he came from. Butchery did play professional football for the Kansas City Chiefs for a time. So he's another guy. Like, Watts would love these guys. Like, football player, athlete, look great, good body, could talk. You know, he's definitely a Bill Watts guy. You know, was in the WWF, feuded with uh, Tito Santana. He had a feud with Ricky Steamboat when he was the IC champion. You know, we talked about him not winning the championship. And then he had that feud with uh, Billy Graham. We did the thing where he, he injured Graham. Oh, and right. Sent him into, yeah, and sent him into retirement permanently. And then Don Morocco came out and made the save. And, like, Don Morocco, a baby face? What? I, that must have been, like, the only... Other than, like, his when he first started in the AWA, it must have been, like, the only other time where he was a baby face. <laughs> like, Don Morocco is one of the greatest heroes of all time. You don't make him baby face? Seriously? Okay. Um, was it WrestleMania 4? Got eliminated by Randy Savage in the tournament. Right. Um, and dominated fucking Savage in that match until uh, he spent too much time being distracted by Elizabeth and then Savage ended up winning. Came back to the NWA or, or came to Jim Crockett Promotions. You know, it was part of the Hiro Matsuda Yamazaki Corporation, which is weird. You remember that? With Flair? Yeah. yeah. yeah that was weird. Everybody is my special guest. Probably the only team in wrestling that can beat the Road Warriors in a Chicago street fight. And the only manager that I know is even more streetwise, more speed.
stinky and more dirty than Paul Ellering. And I'm talking about my special guest, Theodore R. Long and Ron Simmons and Butch Reed Doom. Then he was in Doom. Doom was a badass motherfucking tag team. Yeah, it was. Uh, him and Ron Simmons, this shit was fucking amazing. Again, it, like Doom wasn't around for very long. Like they were only around for like three years, and they eventually had that blow off match at uh, at when they turned Ron Simmons babyface, and they had the blow off match at uh, uh, Super Bowl One. It was inside of a steel cage. It was. It was. They, were, they called it a Thunderdome, but I don't remember that. Why it was a Thunderdome? Like, yeah, this, like it had no like electricity on it, so it was weird. <laughs> That's fucking weird. After that, he's basically you know in the independent circuit uh, for the rest of his time. Retired in 2011, but yeah, Butch Reed, super underrated. He's definitely like, my top ten list of guys that could have been NWA World Champion in the 80s. 
Like if Flair didn't dominate that championship for so long, yeah, he's definitely on my list because he was that fucking good. All right, so that is Butch Reed. Next up, I did want to talk about the AWA. And you're saying, why are we talking about AWA? This is the NWA 1984 project. I get that. But we did talk about the WWF. And we're going to see what's going on in 1984 with the competition. Now, 1984 is, is a strange year for the AWA because a lot of people assume that Hogan leaves and all these other guys leave in the late 83, early 84, and AWA is done at that point, which is not accurate. They had a really good 1984, actually, in terms of attendance and, and all that kind of, and just overall booking. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that what happened was is that they brought in the Road Warriors. And that's when the Road Warriors came in and started dominating the AWA. They brought the Road Warriors in. Uh, they turned uh, Jerry Blackwell and had him team with Greg Gagne against <laughs> Sheik Agnad Al Casey, and they're kind of off and running. So they had actually a really good eight, uh, 84. But if you watch like early 84, you see a lot of fucking shit go down. Where like, So one of the first things you see is like, oh, Jesse Ventura has a new tag team partner. It's fucking Mr. Fucking Torture. Mr. Sato. So Jesse brings in his new tag team partner that he found from the Orient, Mr. Torture, Mr. Saito. But they had Master Saito and then Jesse Ventura as a tag team, and they had him for a couple weeks, and then Jesse's gone. Fans, I, like you, have been waiting anxiously over the past seven days for word from Jesse the Body Ventura out of San Diego, California. Last week, you told us you were going to have some news that would knock, so to speak, the wrestling world out its ear. Tell me something, me, Gene. You really and truly been waiting seven days, Indeed. right? Indeed. Well, I got the news to knock wrestling back, to knock it forward, to do everything to it. The AWA, get ready, because when Jesse the Body speaks, people listen. I'm kind of like E.F. Hutton, you know. But now, about two years ago, I was over wrestling in Japan. And I saw a guy in Japan, now mind you, this is two years ago, that I looked at this dude and I thought, man, what would happen if Jesse the Body Ventura and this man were to become one, were to become a tag team? What you got to say? You have got my curiosity I up, Jesse got your curiosity. I know Mean Gene and I know all the people out there you're thinking right now. Is it the return of Adrian Adonis and the East-West Connection? No, 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 it's not. It's a man who is so devastating. What? If there's anything I lack in wrestling, this man makes up for it. If there's anything he lacks, I make up for it. Are you ready, Mean Gene? I'll tell you, let's get on with the. I want to find get out, out who it is. Let's get out, Mean Gene. Come on out here, my new partner. Oh, you have got to be Mr. kidding me. Saito. Mr. Saito. Your new partner? I cannot believe it. Just when did all of this take place? Oh, I'm very, very happy because he's a lot tough man. Look at that body. Big arms, big chest, strong body. We are good team. Beshi san. I'm so happy to you. Hi. I could present to you this experience on Japanese kimono. That must be you like it. Look I at don't. this, the presentation Ooh. of that all Ooh. silk smoking jacket. No, it's a kimono, not smoking jacket. Kimono, kimono. Look at this. Look at oh, this. Yes. Gentlemen, oh. I'm sorry, we are oh. running short on... We're not running short of time. I'm going to show you real quick, Mean Gene, the power of Mr. Saito. I All right, Japanese power. Yeah. What in the world, gentlemen? What is this? Saito. What are you gonna do? What are I you got gonna a do? Look in my hand. Oh, one thing. Well, look at. Ah. 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 Now, like what like is that? Looks like a Japanese dresser. Look, it's Tom. Just like a Japanese dresser, but Mr. Saito number one, broken next one. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> and they don't really kind of explain why Jesse is gone. Obviously, he went to WWF. Early 84, they come out and say, oh, Dr. D. David Schultz is indefinitely suspended because he kept on running and, and sneak attacking people in their matches. 
But you know the real reason why Dr. D is not there here the WWF. They lost Ventura, they lost Dr. D, they lost Hogan, they lost Gene Okerlund, they lost Adrian Adonis, they lost Ken Patera, like all around like late 83, early 84. And historically, you would think that, hey, that would fucking cripple them. But, you know, they went on. And, you know, with the help of the Road Warriors and some of the other things they're doing, they had a really solid 1984. I think, I think where you can kind of see where they started falling apart was when they started uh, doing the Pro Wrestling USA stuff. Yeah. You can tell that the WWF and their expansion was just driving Vern fucking crazy. <laughs> like, he started taking shots at them. Like, he did some, like, he brought in guys. Like, there were still guys to bring in in, in, 80, in 84. Uh, he, like, he brought in Tony Atlas. You know, there, there were guys to be had. But you can tell it, was just, it, was, it just drove him fucking nuts. And they tried to run New York. And then he got sideways with NWA promotions because they're trying to do this Pro Wrestling USA thing. And when that shit didn't work. And they tried to have a unified front with World Class and, and Memphis. And that didn't work. And I ended up with a lot of fucking shenanigans in town full You know, the question becomes when you talk about AWA, like, what the fuck happened? Like, they could have been, like... Like, they had more talent than anyone else, I would say, per capita. Yeah. You know, than a lot, maybe... You could say, like, NWA had more talent, but that's, like, distributed against, like, fucking 15 different promotions. But as far as, like, a promotion by itself, I think AWA had probably had the most talent at the time of the talent rates by the uh, WWF. And they were hurt by it. But, again, when it comes to the, the talent rates of the WWF... The initial raid doesn't hurt you that bad. What happens is when you go to reload and bring in new talent, and there's no new talent to bring in. And Vern already had a pension for just sticking with his old timers for way too fucking long. So when you have like an 85, an 86, you're still running with Bach Winkle and Ray Stevens, the Crusher, Dick the Bruiser, Baron Rasky, Mad Dog Rashawn, Larry Hennig, so on and so forth. It's like. It's the same fucking thing they've been doing for the last fucking 20 years. And their in-ring product, although they were bringing in new guys every once in a while. But when you have a guy like Scott Hall, who's big and jacked, and he's getting fucking beat down by Baron Ron Rasky, even your most, you know, your most beloved AWA supporters, I'm like, that's fucking bullshit. <laughs> like, their mid, their mid card was tight. I mean, their mid card... You know, you had all these old timers on top. It reminds me a lot of WCW towards the end. You had all these old guys, you know, past their prime, guys in their forties and their fifties, all on top main eventing. And you had like your Kurt Hennig's in the mid card. You would have Scott Hall's in the mid card. You had your Rockers in the mid card, so on and so forth. And you had, you know, you have all these old guys on top. And and Vern just didn't, you know, he was just lost in the sauce at that point. I mean, I think the the business had passed him by. And maybe he wasn't listening to Greg. I don't know how good a booker Greg Gagne is. Uh, from what I understand, probably not a good one. And and you're sitting there and you're relying on old talent where WW, WWF is doing like rock and roll and everything's fresh and everything has a fresh coat of paint on it. And you're literally doing the same thing you were doing in 1975. And even their product in 86 and 87, up until when they ended like in 9091. It looked fucking exactly the same. It did not fucking change. Now, they did, they did have a lot of innovations early on that, that the WWF would incorporate, especially when it comes to their announcers like Gene Oakland. Like, I'm watching AWA, and I see Gene Oakland, blue background, AWA logo. And the WWF wasn't doing that prior to that. It was only after they got Gene when they started having the background and then with the logo was on the back, and he's doing the stand-up interviews. Before right. that, they would do like Vince would do interviews ringside during their studio tapings, and they weren't doing those kind of interviews. Now Crockett would do that too for like syndicated shows, but not looking for like their, their stu- like Memphis didn't do that because Memphis did their interviews at the desk. So the Georgia Championship Wrestling did their interviews at the desk. You know, Florida with Gordon Soley, the, the whole nine. Right. So Vern is doing these interviews. You know, with the backdrop and the logo and Gene, and you look at a year or two later, you see the WWF doing exactly the same fucking thing. So when you talk about WWF and their expansion, not only did they, they raid talent and bring in all this brand new talent, they brought in concepts and they brought in production. 
like I said, they took, they took the production that they had in world class. They took, you know, they took guys from behind the scenes, which probably hurt a lot of these promotions more than the guys, the wrestlers in front of the cameras. So that's what I think. That's what really, kind of, really, really fucking hurt them. Obviously, like losing Heenan, big fucking deal. Losing Oakland, big deal. And losing Jesse Ventura. Jesse Ventura goes on to be an announcer, one of the greatest announcers of all time. Oakland and backstage interviewer. Bobby Heenan, a manager, and eventually a commentator, and so forth. You know, those those guys were fucking cornerstones of what the WWF were doing, and they were all, all in the AWA. Now losing Hogan hurt, but I'll say this: Hogan was going to go anyway. If he would have put the belt on Hogan and gave him his money, like Vince would have gave him double that money. Like he still would have went, and it's a good possibility he would have went with your belt too. So maybe it was a good thing that they didn't put the belt on on Hogan. Because Hogan would have yeah. went with their fucking belt. Right. And they made mistakes, too. Like, putting the belt on uh, on Hanson, and Hanson was like, I'm not going to defend it, and then ran over the belt and sent it back. You know, that kind of shit. Putting the belt on Lawler wasn't a mistake. They just needed to do it earlier. If they would have put the belt on Lawler, you know, in the late 70s, you know, or 80, 81, 82, that would have been fine. By 1988, they kind of <laughs> long in the tooth for that. But then, you know, he, he gets a shitty payoff from Super Clash and just keeps the belt. So they just put the belt on fucking Larry Zabisco. Because Larry was married to one of Vern's daughters. So there you go. You yeah. trust somebody. A, a lot of weird concepts. And then they just basically ran out of talent. And then in the late, in the late 80s, early 90s, where you had like the Trooper. You had, you had a young Scott Norton, but he was like a lumberjack. And it was weird. You, see, you saw a young Eric Bischoff. They just didn't have enough talent. The destruction yeah. crew yeah. to kind of just to make a go out of it, and eventually, you know, you know, Vern's money got tight, and eventually he had to fo- close up operations, and, and and it sucks because that's a mainstay. That was the first. That was the first territory to break away from the NWA. Yeah, and remember this is that it was Vern wanted to be NWA champion, and he would always say like, "Oh, fucking Luthez doesn't want to wrestle me because he's no, I'll beat him." Blah 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 blah. <laughs> so they went and made their own fucking belt, and. You know, one of the things too that you gotta look at too, like Vern, Vern let put himself over. So picture this: would this work in today's environment? You have a wrestler who's also the owner of the company, and in his retirement match wins the World Heavyweight Championship. Would that fly today? Mm. Would people fucking lose their fucking mind. Essentially, Vern Gagne retired as AWA champion. Yeah. That's fucked. That is fucked. You know, you had a lot of a lot of a lot of weird stuff. You know, you had Otto Vons who who paid Vern to be AWA champion. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Jumbo Shirudo as NW, as uh, AWA champion. That was cool for a little bit. Rick Martel as the champ. So it was like, nah. you know, kind of throwing stuff against the wall to see if it would stick. So. So Matt, what do you what are your thoughts on the A and W A eighty four and and beyond? Well, I, I actually watched a lot of it because ESPN carried it quite a while, um, and yeah, got used to it as as a show I watch. But I I think it's one of those things where it was bumpkin wrestling with a better, you know, uh, PR because there was so much of it that was so low brow. Like Greg Gagne, everyone watching him being like. Does that dude even work out? Like, yeah. look, bro, like he looked terrible. And I get that he's your kid, but you could have used some other capacity. I know this is, you know, lost on that generation because they wouldn't have turned a guy like him heel. But man, he could have got such heat. Yeah. You know, talk about jumping the McMahon approach. You know, as the spoiled brat son. You know, I would have turned Eric Watts heel in like 1993 WCW and have yep. him be like a daddy's boy. Yeah, totally. You know, like a whiny fucking rich kid. You know, that would have worked for for Eric Watts, but yeah, Greg. I mean, they never put the belt on him. He was never necessarily spent a whole lot of time in the main event. Mm. He was mostly in tags with with Jim Brunzel, yeah. the High Flyers. You know, I mean, that's what they, that's basically where they placed him. Now, did he even deserve that position? Who knows? You know, he wasn't like he was the champ and beat everybody. You know, he was you know upper mid card. I guess he would have him. Yeah, um, but again, it's yet to be determined if he actually deserved that spot all on its own. So, you know, it's weird. I think we're gonna be talking more AWA in the future at, at some point. But um, 
the AWA eighty four still still going strong. Um, it's probably not as good as as Mid South eighty four. That's probably the best wrestling going on at the time. Is that Mid South eighty four? No, we'll take a look at Memphis and see what's going on over in Memphis. Maybe maybe next episode and see how they stack up. What's going on in Mid South? Uh, definitely not Crockett. Crockett is a fucking mess in eighty four. Uh, the fact that they even make it to eighty five, like it's it's a fucking mess. And you know, Florida is well, Florida is still Florida. You know, doing their thing in eighty four, but. You know, definitely the cream of the crop in '84 is definitely mid south. I'm, and not for nothing, I like a lot of stuff that WWF was doing in '84 too. You know, you know, that goes out. You know, between you know Slaughter and Iron Sheik and 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 Hogan is, is trying to get over and Piper and Snuka. You know, they're doing some pretty good stuff over there in the WWF as well. So again, we're right, we're heading right into the a new boom period. Um, well, at least a boom period for the WWF and, and Jim Crockett, and then everyone else kind of falls to the wayside, but. No, we'll go over that in, in great detail uh, as uh, these episodes, uh, as we do these episodes. So, so yeah. So tell me how much you love the Team Challenge series. <laughs> that was one of the biggest fiascos. I remember a few things from it. One was Colonel De Beers' team always seems to have won, but didn't get the right points. <laughs> uh, I remember the. Who Jake, thought it was a good idea to have Colonel De Beers be like pro apartheid? Like, why was that a good idea? Uh, well, I get as a heel, but let, don't make a team. Don't make a nineteen ninety. Every pile drove Jimmy Snook on the concrete. I remember that vividly. I would just say that you know I think that there were aspects of it I can appreciate that kind of like kind of like the Bound for Glory series. They could right. you know build up a match. Okay, whoever wins this match, or they win by pinfall, they get this many points. Okay, fine. But having Jake the Milkman Milliman. When you're a turkey challenge thing, just kind of was the nail in the coffin for me. I think Slaughter, like, left in the middle of that thing, too. I think Zabisco's team won it, too. <laughs> yeah, it was just... Like, how are you going to have your top heel win that shit? Yeah, the, the, the thing, too, is you only do something like that if you're going to make it, like, a... Whatever, I don't know. It, just, it was terrible. Weird. It was terrible. You know, I just realized, I was watching an interview with Dusty not too long ago, and he does not like Larry Zabisco. <laughs> Uh, he said something to the fact that, like, Larry Zabisco, top guy? Yeah, Axe Vern Gagne, how that went for him. Like, ooh, 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 ooh. Like, damn, Dusty. Okay. Uh, we'll do it. Yeah. But, yeah, that's uh, the AWA in a nutshell. Um, I don't know. Without, without eliminating Vern and Greg from that equation, I don't know if that could be salvaged. Like, we do, like, a lot of what-if scenarios. Right. Like, without, like, maybe if Watts came in, like, in eighty in 88, maybe they had a shot. But even that would have been rough. Like, say Watts sold Mid-South and, and like, oh, I'm going to go run at AWA with that money and I want to buy it from Vern. Maybe they would have a shot. But without revamping their production from soup to nuts not and bringing in... And bringing in stars, like legitimate guys that had star power, which, you know, were all just, you know, they were taken. They were taken. And I often wonder if, if Magnum didn't get in his accident. For Magnum to get over as NWA champion, you would have to send the flare somewhere. You know, would they, would they have sent him to the AWA for six months or a year? You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, he's from there. You know, he thought he was trained by fucking Vern. He would have been the guy to get. If I was Vern, I would have tried to do anything in my power to get a fucking Flair. Flair and Steamboat. Because those are guys that they were they came from my training camp. They're homegrown guys. You know, people really get into it. But I was wondering how they got that fucking ESPN show. They had that show for fucking five years. Oh, I think they definitely had some kind of deal. I mean, they had, they had, a, they had, they had a deal. I mean... I mean, like, this came out of nowhere. Like, they were, like, didn't realize what they had. Well, kids, I don't think people gave ESPN the respect, like, in 85, even in 1990. Like, they weren't as big as they got. You know what I mean? Like, if WWF, WWF would probably really like to be on ESPN today. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they would love to be on ESPN today. But, yeah, they were able to get on, on you know, basically nationwide cable. I mean, WWF was on USA and... And Jim Crockett was on TBS. ESPN is, you know, is a pretty big, pretty big deal. And you know, ESPN still runs their their reruns on like ESPN Classics or 
ESPN <laughs> ate the Ocho. Was it one of your favorite shows of all time, like Super Clash 3? It was as far as just being a complete disaster, but <laughs> I, I think the the funniest thing I took away from that was always the Kerry Von Eric Jerry Lawler match where he was bleeding so badly and Frank Dusick, the ref keeps trying to stop him, and Frank Dusick's like, No, 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 he's fine, he bleeds all the time. <laughs> just such a such a like, great response. You heard that Vern fucking killed a dude? And what? fucking yeah, in his uh he was at an old age home, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, is that the appropriate term for that? I think it is, right? Sure. So he's in a retirement home and you know, he has the dementia and he has uh and like he's another with other dudes that have dementia and shit. And he got fucking pissed one day and fucking killed the dude. Like uh. Vern, like people under like people like Vern Gagne is a fucking joke. Vern Gagne is the real fucking deal. Like legitimate fucking tough dude. Like even Dr. D David Schultz, who's notorious for like fucking just saying I am tougher than everyone else in the entire world, like yeah. I'm, I can beat a Hulk Hogan type shit, like Doctor D, legitimate bounty hunter, like one of the toughest dudes in the world. Mm-hmm. He said in the interview, he was like, man, he was talking about the uh, Hulk Hogan and uh, Vern Gagne got in a fight, and Greg was gonna jump in, and and Doctor D was like, nah, boy, you don't want none of that. So he kind of backed off Greg and let and let fucking Hogan and uh, and Vern kind of work it out. But he said it's like I would have, you know, if Greg would have jumped in, I would have jumped in, and I think Vern would have kicked my ass. <laughs> and this is Doctor David Schultz saying this, and he he don't, he don't give us no shits. Yeah. So legitimate tough guy was supposed to be in the Olympics, but he didn't get an opportunity to go. Like I don't know if they boycotted that year or or some shit happened. He won two NCAA championships and and uh, amateur wrestling. He was an alternate for USA Freestyle Wrestling in the 1948 Olympics. He was drafted by the Chicago Bears in 1947. So, like, you know, legitimate athlete, legitimate tough guy. And people, you know, he's kind of a I, – sometimes I, I think he gets remembered as a, as a punchline a little bit, which is a little sad. You know? Yeah, it's sad. We're like, oh, he's like the old guy, the old out-of-touch guy who ran and who got trampled by fucking Vince McMahon. And, you know, he was a legitimate businessman, made a lot of money for a long period of time. Again, understand this, that the AWA ran from 1959 to fucking 1991. And, you know, a lot of people up in that area, a lot of that people up in that, you know, Midwest, you know, even Southern Canada area have a, a reverence for the AWA. I mean, yeah, they lost their way towards the end, but that was towards the end. And all these promotions lost their way towards the end. You know, he wasn't the only one. Uh, but for for an extended period of time, he had one of the best wrestling promotions out there. So, you know, maybe put the belt on himself a little too much, though. But <laughs> what are you going to do? All right. All right. So that is the AWA in a nutshell. We will be diving into that more uh, as the weeks um, go by. So be on the lookout for that. All right, guys. So we are officially out of time. So catch us on our next episode. It will be live. From Portland, Oregon. Main event of this show will be Bruiser Brody take on Al Madrill. And we're going to have Dr. D. David Schultz taking on <laughs> Billy Jack Haynes. You think we're in a fight in real life? Billy Jack Haynes or Dr. D. David Schultz? I'm going with Dr. D. But yeah. Billy, Billy Jack's is fucking. You know, he said he fucking like assassinated people for the Clintons recently. Oh, jeez. Yeah. No. All right, guys. So we'll see you on the next episode. For Matt Riley, I'm Juan Cena. Have a good night.